be alive. <laughs> it's good to be with you all. And uh, I thank you with all my heart and all my soul for for coming and for, for making me feel so much alive again. And, and I needed this. This is really wonderful. I think it's coming out this. Hello? Hello? There you go. Thanks for showing up, Benny. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, the one, I'm the one that uh, is thanking you because this is, uh, I don't know, this is a return from, you know, a really dark time for me. And uh, this, you know, is a, is a new day, you know, and it's a, it's like a new life, you know? It's a, it's a new everything and it feels it feels so good. I never appreciated life as much as I do today. So, so of course the question everybody wants to know. Where have you been? Where the fuck have you been? You know, I did, like yesterday the answer to that is in hell. It wasn't rock and roll hell. Either. Part of it was, but uh, I I made it out of the, the door that was. It was a door that it was like that movie Midnight Express. Does anybody know that movie? Do you know that m moment in the movie when that poor guy was basically at the end of his, his days here on Earth. And he found that moment where he found freedom again, you know? He escaped the, the sadistic guard and the pain he was going through. So it was, uh, it was 20 years of uh, a really dark time and uh, it's behind me now, thanks to you, thanks to all of you. Every day, I go, God, what a great day this is, you know? I'm alive, I feel better than I did 30 years ago. And uh, I've got a lot of music in me. And it, I think it was my guitar and my music that saved me for all the last, you know, years I haven't seen you, but um, it's, it's really great to be back, better than ever. And I love you too. And I and this this is so it's it's so overwhelming to see some so many of you here and to come and see me. You know, I really thought I was forgotten. And uh, and, and I'm I'm not an internet person, so uh, all I heard was you know you know all the negative stuff and there was so many bad things that happened and uh, so I said, you know, I'm forgotten, you know, there was no way that, that I would have expected this to ever happen. So, God bless you and I really appreciate it. This is the guy, this is the person that spent eight months of his life. He, he was, Derek Christopher was, I said this yesterday, he, he spent, he, he didn't give up, you know, and he spent eight months emailing um, my best friend, my, my lawyer. You, I know you guys know this name, but I want you to meet him, Mark Nolan. Mark, all right, Mark, give Mark a hand. He never gave up. He was always there for me. And uh, Mark said, "This is a good guy, this guy Derek." Say hi. Hey. Good evening. <laughs> I'm smart enough to know nobody came to hear from a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, but see, Mark, Mark is a friend, though. Mark is. 
he's, he's, you know, he's a lord, but he's, he's been more, more, my friend more than anything else. And uh, so he said, you know, this guy Derek Christopher, you know, seems like a really nice guy and he wants you to do a convention. And I said, yeah, but nobody will come. You know? <laughs> And he says, oh, he's a really good guy. Let's 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 talk to Derek. So here we are. So uh, I hope I can speak to you all uh, honest from my heart because uh, I said I said to the you know the, the crowd yesterday that um, I never got a chance to do that you know in the last God it was you know a lot of, a long time ago. But the last of those interviews were, it was the time, if you look at the 80s, <clears throat> it's really hard for me to look at those interviews because they were like, like fake, you know, it was all scripted, it was, you know, press relations, publicity firm, you know, constructed, and I never really had a chance to, to, to really, you know, to, to talk to you like, like we're sitting around having a cup of coffee, you know, and... Or like like being a friend, you, you talk to a friend. So I'm hoping that uh, I know there's a lot of rumors, there's a lot of things going on, and we could talk about them and have you hear it from me, uh, the truth, you know, and what's real, what's not, and I'm all yours. You know, yesterday when we talked, I thought it was it was really touching, and, and maybe you can tell to to this group about. Um, I asked you about when you thought Kiss was going to hire you, and they didn't. And it was such a touching story. Can you share that with all of these people? That what happened? Um, for everybody that was that wasn't here this last night, it was it was a you know a long story. Um, do you want? The long story or the short story? Long story! The long story. Um, it's, it's really hard to repeat the same words, but I can give you in steps how it, it came to be. If this is important for you, I'll, I'd be happy to tell you. Um, <clears throat> I moved to, moved to LA in Hollywood, actually, in 1978. And a friend, a really good friend of mine, who was from Connecticut, named Gary Prado. And we had, we had grown up together, and his mom and my mom were friends. Gary moved to California, moved to Hollywood, he became a, a big agent at um, William Morris Agency. So he said to me, I'm bringing, I'm getting you out of Connecticut, I'm gonna take you out of Bridgeport, you're gonna come to Hollywood and you need to make it, and I'm going to get you a place to live. And uh, he actually got me a really, he got me a bungalow. I'll never forget, it was right under the Hollywood sign. And, you know, it went from black and white, you know, TV, to, in a, in a way, to, to moving to this, you know, like, wow, I'm really here, this is unbelievable. I was there about a year, and nothing happened, and I had to go back. I had to go back home, back to Connecticut. And uh, when I went back home, I ended up working with uh, Edgar Winter Group. Uh, and then something said, you gotta go back to California. So we went back and I, it was uh, my wife and myself, Anne Marie. And we said, let's give it a try. Let's, we, we didn't give it enough time. So we went back and things weren't going well for a long time. And we just kept trying and nothing happened. But I was recording a lot of songs and I kept saying, I'm not gonna give up, I'm not gonna give up. I think, I think it's still out there, you know? And I, whatever little money I had, I was recording demos. And I was telling Derek yesterday and the people that, you know, sometimes, you, you know, they don't come out well. You know, you only have a little bit of money and you can't buy the best studios and you, you, know, you get what you, you, what, whatever money you have get whatever that can buy. And then when the clock runs out, you know, on, 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 it's like putting money in a, in a machine and it just runs out and then you gotta put more money in it. So when you, 
you know, you only get whatever quality you can afford. So I said, I don't care. Let me just record these songs. And so one of those songs was Back on the Streets. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I thought, this, this really, I think this has it, you know. And um, another one of those songs was I Need Love. But that was later changed to Shoot Me Full of Love. So it was in the early stage, and there was a few others. So I had these, these demos, and I thought, someone maybe will like this. Took them to all the record companies, and it was like, yeah, kid, yeah, kid, yeah. Keep working on it, kid, you'll, you know, you'll get there. So, you know, it's always that discouraging thing, you know what you want? You go back home, you work on more. And, ah. Uh, I heard through, you know, just like every every other guitar player hears, uh, that Kiss was looking for a guitar player, and I just thought, well, that's for me. I know that I know I'm right for that band, you know, and but uh, that's too much, way too big. I mean, that's like the ultimate dream of the ultimate dreams, and and uh, I. For, just for fate, you know, entering my life in a very strange way, um, back on the streets found its way to Michael James Jackson, who was producing what was going to be Creatures of the Night album. Although at the time, he was working with Kiss in the studio at the record plant, and they were looking Kiss were looking for songs, and they were looking for a guitar, guitarist. But I didn't know any of this, other than there was a chance that I would be auditioning for the band. So one thing led to another, which was Michael Heard back on the streets, and he said, I like this song so much, let me give it to Gene and Paul and see what they say, and I remember waiting at home, I was literally looking at the telephone, you know, here's my number, you know, and I'm, I'm just watching the phone, man. for days I'm watching the phone, and then he says, I remember getting this phone call, and he says, Vinny, this is Michael Jack Michael James Jackson, and I said, yeah, uh-huh, 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 you know, and the guys really loved the song, and we want you to come to the, to the studio, to the, and it was the record plant. And this is the way I remember it, so most of this is like crystal, still very crystal clear in my mind. And so I came to the studio, and one of the first songs that I'm recording for this record in with Kiss in this studio was Back on the Streets. So that recording with Paul singing Back on the Streets still exists because it was originally recorded for the Creatures of the Night album. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, look, this is too big for my mind to handle. But at, at the same time, I just, I felt I was so right for this band, you know, even though the dream was bigger than me. You know, was life bigger than, you know, us or are we bigger than life? It was, it was hard to know, but... This was bigger than life for me, but I, I felt in my heart that, that this was meant to be. And we, we just kept recording, and, and one thing led to another. Michael said, you know, this is a good match. I want you to write more songs with Gene and Paul. And I'm thinking, this is like, this is like not happening to me. This is happening to me, you know? And, and you just never really believe that you're doing this with people like this that you've idolized all your life, you know? This was like somebody saying to me, in my world, you know, which which is exactly what I experienced with them, but like, like George Martin saying, we want you to write with Paul McCartney and John Lennon, and it was like, no way. You know? So that was, that was how, how it was for me, and you know, meeting them was, you know, at, at first, it was, I feel like I know you because I feel like I'm so, I'm what you want and what you need and what I can bring to the band. And then we, we began writing songs together and then 
one thing led to another, which was the songs themselves, how they came to be. So I Love It Loud uh, began to find its way, you know, as a completed song, and I'm thinking, this is, this is the magic, you know, that I've, I've always been looking for. And um, I couldn't believe it was happening, you know? And Paul and I began writing songs, and the first, one of the first songs we wrote was I Still Love You. And I think, geez, this is a you know? And, you know, the, the, the clarity of all of this is so, so wonderful for me, because the memories are what we're all here for, you know? The music that Kiss left all of us with, and, and the, the great times, and the, you know, the years of us growing up, and how much we love this music, and this is really why I'm here, is to celebrate all of this with you. And, and it brings me back to these times, which were, you know, actually some of my happiest memories ever. So we, the songs were coming together and developing, and then while, while we, I, we were working together, while these songs were, were becoming songs, they were still having guitar players come in and audition. Is this what you remember me telling you? And each time somebody would come in, I'm thinking, Oh, you know, this, this guy's got the job, you know, he's really great looking, you know. Uh, and I would, I would say to Gene, well, this is after we got to know each other a little bit. I'd say, why don't you pick me? Because I'm writing the songs with you. I mean, we've got a magic, you know. Look at the songs Paul and I are writing and you and I are writing. And Killer was one of, the, one of the five songs that we wrote together. And I said, well, this, is, this magic is happening, you know, why don't you pick me? I'm right for this band, you know. And I said, look at me playing, and I get on my knees and go, don't get on your knees. It's, it's like, okay, you know, you don't think so? No, it looks stupid. <laughs> okay, okay, got it, you know. And, and I mean, he, they know best, what did I know, you know? And um, I, I was just, you know, still cooking spaghetti at home, you know, so what, am I, what do I know? So, I mean, I think I ate that every night for, you know, for six months in a row, you know, because that was all we could afford. And um, so, he said, no, you're too short. And I said, uh, I said, you're going to let that stop you? Stop this band? I said, because I really think we we're meant to be. And, and Gene, Gene's like, he's really a uh, very, very special person. I know, <laughs> you know, I, you know, he got kicked off Fox News for life, but uh, there's word out there that he also got kicked off the Ed Sullivan show for life, but <laughs> if it ever comes back on again, <laughs> but they'd, gotta, they'd have to get Ed Sullivan back before that. <laughs> now that was fun, that was a joke, so. Uh, <laughs> but G Gene is... I really, if, if you're hearing me, Gene, you know how much I adore you. So, do you hear me, Gene? <laughs> Gene, are you here? <laughs> are you here, Gene? Do you know how much I adore you or what? So, <laughs> we had our downside for 20 years and it, it was really unnecessary, but I adore him and I also adore Paul. Without them, I would not be here talking to you, so um, they hold a really special place in my heart, in my life. So anyway, so getting back to this story, and I'll try to sum it up quick. It kept saying, no, you're not right. You're not, we're looking for somebody six feet tall, and so after, we're still writing these songs, and I, every guitarist, li literally all, all over the country, was walking through the recording studio, and I, every time I'd see somebody, I'd say, well, he's got the job, he's beautiful. You know, oh, this guy's, oh, look at him, he looks like a Greek god, he's got the job, you know. And then I'd look in the mirror and i go, Jesus, you're not gonna get this job, look at you. you know? So, so I see these beautiful guys, I mean, absolutely beautiful guys, and then, so I would, I would go home discouraged and 
thank you. Uh, okay, I'll never get this. This went on for many months, and uh, I finally recorded the record with him, and I went home. And they said, "Well, we're flying to New York, Vinny. Thanks for, thanks for, you know, thanks for the work. The record sounds great." So I was home, and I was really discouraged. And now home to me was, you know, this this little apartment, and. Uh, Anne Marie, who was my wife at the time, she's no longer with with us. She's no, she's deceased. But she's the mother of my my, my girls, and uh, she was a, a really beautiful person, and she was my best friend. So she worked, she worked her, she worked like two jobs supporting us in California. And you know, she she saved my life in many ways, but uh, she got she was pregnant, and I didn't know we were about to have twins, and we we're still in California, and I get a call from from I think it was one of uh, I think it was from the, a tour manager, and said. The guys want you to come to New York and play another guitar solo for Keep Me Coming. I said, wow, really? You know, I said, really? So yeah, we want you back, so come on back. So well, here's a ticket, get on the plane. I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing, okay? And not knowing what was about to happen, I got to New York, and uh, I remember Eric met me at the airport. and. Took me to the hotel, I checked in, went right to the recording studio, and started to, you know, hear the song, and I think about a day later, the solo was born, it was finished, and everybody seemed really happy. So I go, I give, thanks Vin, it was really good, I think we really had a great track, and everybody's really happy, and good luck. I said, oh, really? <laughs> Really? You sure? Yeah. Good luck! Eric will take you to the airport. So I said, well, thanks a lot. You know, all my best. And, you know, this was like the greatest experience of my life. Do you remember in this the way I told you told it yesterday? What I remember is the phone call that you got. The phone call? Yeah. Got everybody choked. Well, the phone call was that Eric took me to the airport to go home. And um, I said, well, thanks a lot, Eric, you know, this was like such, such a great time, and I'll never forget it. So I'm getting, walking on the airport, I'm walking, I'm walking onto the plane, to board the plane, and I hear, I, I just look back, I remember, I see him, he goes, Vinny, 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 don't get out of the plane. I'm like, you know, what? <laughs> come on back, come on back, come on back. So, um. I, get, I come back, and the way I remember it was, he says, um, Gene wants to talk to you. So Gene says to me, listen, um, we want you to stick around here. We want to have some, we want, we want to play live. We want you to play in, in the rehearsal studio with us and see how it goes. And I said, really? He says, yeah, we'll put you up for a couple days and let's, let's rehearse at SIR. And I said, oh, wow, okay, 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 great, wow, wow, you know. So, rehearsed, we rehearsed for a couple of days, and I, I thought, gee, this is sounding so great. And then he says, well, thanks, Ben, we'll, we'll call you, you know, don't worry, we'll, we'll see what happens, and we're going to rehearse, we're going to audition some other guitar players. So, I said, oh, wow, okay, thanks, so I had a great time. Thanks so much, I'll never forget this. So, Eric will take you to the airport. <laughs> Get in the car with Eric and he takes me to the airport. He says, don't worry, Vin, everything will be all right, okay? I said, yeah, well, all right, okay. Well, I said, you have my number, you know where to call me, right? Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm getting back, I go back to Los Angeles and um, go back to my apartment. Now I'm there, now I'm really, you know, I don't know what to think, so I, most of me had 
thought, God, I wrote these songs, we got the magic, you know. But then Gene says, I'm too short, and it's not gonna work. So then we rehearse. And I thought, this is all going so well. And then I get the call again. One more call, I'll never forget this. And um, I think it was Gene, it was Gene, he said, Vin, we want you to join the band. Now, the call came at the moment I am in the bathtub taking a bath. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was like a real simple tub, you know, but I said, oh, I need a bath, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get clean here, you know. And, and it was, I wasn't home long. And he said, we want you to come back to New York, get on the next plane, and we're, you're gonna be in the band, you're gonna be our new guitarist. And I went, And as much as I could repeat it from yesterday, that was that was it. But you know, it was it was a long time of the oh, I don't know. You know, looking at uh, Anne Marie being pregnant, and we had nothing. You know, we we had we had nothing. We didn't have. You know, we we, we had a car that was like a six, 1965. I'll never forget this, it was a Dodge Dart, and there was no floor in the car, and it, you know, we had no way to think that there was a dream that, that could be, you know, that would find, that would find me, but, you know, with, with all of the pieces, God must have wanted it to work, otherwise it never would have, but, um, you know, it was just one of these these gifts of life that uh, brought me to you. So uh, we we made great music, and our, our our band became so great. The problem I remember was that I was stepping into Ace's shoes. I was in a replacement, and I I didn't think there was any way to you know to replace. To you can't replace Ace. You know, there's no way to do that. You know, he was like, you know, he was a god in his own way, and part of the band that was, you know, this this incredible, incredible piece of rock history, and I was there to, um, you know, I was there to to give him, you know, my my you know adoration and saying. I could never replace you, so I'll do the best I can, you know, to to make the band as you know as good as we could be. So, was, was there, you know, Eric set precedent that they created a new character for him. Was there ever any talk of you wearing Ace's makeup, or were you going to be an original character from the beginning? There was not a talk of Ace's makeup. No, no. Um, actually, actually, I think I have a picture. Oh, it was it was something similar to Ace's makeup, but it wasn't his. It was like a uh, another version of that. But um, all of all of the pieces became so you know they they laid out which with without design. It almost seems like you couldn't have planned any of this if you tried, you know. And it, it was a, a, a power greater than anybody that that just let this piece connect to this piece and connect to this because you, you just there's no way people could it would seem there's no way that, that we can be in control of any of this you know it was a big difference it really was it, he asked if there was a difference between playing with the makeup and without it was a big difference uh, for the reason that um, The, the days with the makeup were you now try to re, try to realize it from the eyes of Gene and Paul, and they taught me so much. You know, I mean, I I was I, you know I was inexperienced. I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just a guitar player. I had songs in me, and I had a, I had the vision, the dream. But I mean, you know, I. 
they taught me how to perform, they taught me, you know, to have, you know, a worldly, worldliness that I couldn't, I didn't have, you know, and, you know, when you, when you don't have anything, you know, I mean, I grew up in a poor family, and, you know, we did our best, you know, like everybody, and we struggled, and, you know, this, these were people that, that I idolized, so, to, to, to try to be there, you know, I know I'm going off subject, but it's all part of it, you know, and, and what they taught me was um, how to be part of their world when, you know, I was only, you know, my world was really small, you know, and what did I know? I didn't know any better. I wanted to know better, but they helped me. They helped, they molded me, you know, in the early days with the makeup, Gene and I always shared a, a car, you know, a limo after the show, and he would always tell me, well, don't do this. You look stupid doing this. Oh, that thing you did was pretty good. But he, he would always say, the, the, you know, it, it was hard to hear. It was, it was so hard because, you know, you want to please, I wanted so much to please them, you know? And for me, that was everything, to please them, to make them feel like, I'm I, I'm worthy of this, and you know I want you to be proud of me. I want you to I want you to want me, you know. And uh, a lot of this was my insecurity because I never felt that they wanted me. You know? I know Paul didn't want me, but uh, I think Gene saw the potential, and I think Paul would say, I don't know why we got this guy, you know. And I I would think, well, I'm here, but I I think I think you're wrong. I think I'm. There's a new page, there's a new chapter that's going to happen for this band. I don't know how or why, but I don't think it's the wrong, I don't think this was the wrong thing to happen. I think this was going to work. But I didn't know at the time. So, Gene would always say, I don't think you need to do this. This doesn't work. No, everything you do, you look stupid. Don't do this. You look good here, you don't look good here. What you're playing here, don't do it, you know. So, now why do you say Paul didn't want you there? I don't, I, let me tell you something about Paul. No, no, I, I, I really want, I want you to hear this because yesterday I said, mean Mr. Mustard. And as soon as I said that, it was all over the internet. And I thought, because I, I did a show with, with Eddie Trump. We did an interview. He said, tell me about Paul. And I said, mean Mr. Mustard. <laughs> and, but that's a Beatles song. I don't know who knows that, who doesn't know that. So, what I can tell you about Paul is this. It's really, really um, something that's my, my, only I would know. But people that are that gifted have, like, like, like all of us, we have, we have our personalities, you know? We have our, what, what it is that makes us who we are. And when we knew each other then, you know, I, there was no way I could be in his world, you know? And so for the things that were my shortcomings, Paul's very perceptive, you know? And he would say, I hate this thing, this thing that you do, I hate it. And I wouldn't see it through his eyes until I got older. And, but he is, he's really a really extremely kind soul. And he's a great singer. He's the ulti ultimate perfectionist, professional. He's the ultimate front man. I mean, he's Paul Stanley, you know. But I love him. And I'll tell you what, I had the greatest time with Paul when we were writing and performing. But my shortcomings, I wasn't able to see at the time, you know, because, because I wasn't, I wasn't looking at it through, through his eyes, you know. And it, 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 the idea of what I said was in a, in a, it was a part of my love for him, but this is, you know, he has this way of, of looking at, at 
people's, you know, rightfully so. But he has a way of zeroing in on my problems, you know, what he finds like doesn't sit right with him. And and that's fine because you 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 live, you learn, and you grow, you know? And then when I look back at the things I did, I go, ah, oh, what a you know, God, what a jerk, you know. But I look back at some of the things I've said, I go, ah, oh, we shouldn't have said that. So seeing it from his eyes, you know, although some of the things he said is hurtful to me, uh, if he was right, then then that's the way it is, you know. And I'm not saying this to you know to cop out on anything, but when you grow, when this journey is over, you've got to say to yourself, did you learn anything? You know, were you better for it or were you not? If you don't learn, then you never get better as a person. Or, and, and I really wanted to be, I wanted to be better, you know. I wanted to be more knowledgeable. I wanted to, you know, be better than I was, you know. So all of my life, all I did was play guitar, play guitar, play guitar. Listen to just play guitar, write songs, like, and and whatever else came as being, you know, living and being, you know, a worldlier person. I wasn't there. That was not what I was at that time. So, um, I say I say some of the things I said because I know he wrote a book, and I know <laughs> I know he said these things. I'm like, God, you know. But was he right? Maybe he probably was, you know. And uh, so do I remember? No, I don't remember. But I know some of the things happened, like somebody said to me, uh, wasn't that Paul, you yelled at him, uh, you know, they cut you off on a guitar solo, you know. And it's like, and I yelled, you know, oh, I wanted to play, let me play, you know. But it, I didn't see things the way I should have said, seen them or what, what the way I could have seen them had it been later in my life but so be it we made great music and i'm fucking proud of it you know yeah. so what ultimately led i mean you had creatures lick it up the great tours and then after lick it up things seemed to fall apart what happened they didn't fall apart they were stronger than ever, and the problem was really simple. I was writing a lot of songs, and I felt us growing so much as a band, and I wanted them to want me, and I know that they wanted, I, I know they wanted Eric, they loved Eric, but I didn't feel that they wanted me, and uh, even after Lick It Up is, is you know, the perception of it, you know, was a big album. And I still felt, uh, no matter what I do, they're, they're just not gonna want me in this band, you know? And there was a contract they wanted me to sign, but I was bringing, my take home pay was $550 a week. So I never made any money being in the band. Wait, so you were making $550 a week? Take home pay. Take home. Of Kiss during the Lick It Up tour, or the, the whole period? From the beginning to the end, it was five hundred fifty dollars a week. Pardon me. Well, that's what they paid me. I mean, that was my take home after after taxes. And to be honest with you, I wanted so much. This was my dream to be in this band. This was I I, I didn't want anything as much as I wanted this. This was like, like you know maybe just a little bit so I can buy a house or something, you know? Maybe I could buy a nice car, you know, something. But it, it, there was just, you know, that, that wasn't gonna happen. And uh, there was a contract that they wanted me to sign. It was an employment contract. And there was literally nothing in it for me. And I, I have to be honest, otherwise, you know, we're, we're, I'm here for nothing. Uh, if, if you don't hear it, because these are all the questions everybody has had, um, if I don't tell you the truth, or at least my, my truth, my version, which I've never really told anybody, but if I don't tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm, 
it, this is all bullshit, and I want you to, to know. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It doesn't, this is all for nothing for me. And I was making $550 a week. I had a family. I had twins that I didn't know I was going to have. And there was no money to take care of. And there was no money to buy a home. We were living with relatives, and I was on call 24 hours a day, which was okay. It was all okay. But I couldn't move on. There was no future. There was a future being Vinnie Vincent of Kiss and, you know, what that, what that was. But financially, there was no future in it for me. And it, I, I didn't want to be a, a royalty member, although that would have been nice, but that's not what I asked for. I just asked for something that, you know, could take me out of living in an apartment or with my relatives and maybe, a, you know, a nice car instead of driving around in the Lego, you know, a car the size of a, of, a, of a can of tuna, you know, and, you know, and, and, and while I'm on the road, I've got, you know, a family, you know, i got little children and I, you know, I, I'm on the road and I'm no, I'm saying to myself, yeah, but they're driving on the freeway with a car like this and I got two infants and what if something happens? These are not the things that I wanted to have on my mind. I wanted to know that they were well taken care of and at least that some of my value, my worth to them would have been special to them and said, look, we can afford to make this work for you, you know, and they just didn't. So at the end of Lick It Up Tour, the pressure was so, so, so unbearable uh, to sign this contract. And it was a contract that, that was all for us and none for Vinny. And I said, I can't, I can't, I can't. Just please treat me better than, than this and everything will be fine. It was nothing. I never saw any royalties during the time I was in the band. There was just a paycheck of, that, that I took home 550 bucks a week. So after Lick It Up Tour, you know, it was a success, and I'm thinking, we have a great band. We, this is a new chapter, you know. This is now, the makeup came off. You know, this was probably for, for Gene and Paul, a really difficult time, because that, you know, the makeup was what the band was. To, to, to remove it, I think, was a bit of a relief. This is my opinion. It's a bit of a relief, but a bit of, you know, uh, a bit of fear, trepidation, um, because you didn't know what was coming. But Lick It Up said, even with Vinny, this worked, you know? So the songs are great, the reception was great, the tours were great, and at the end of the Lick It Up tour, I remember the last unfortunate thing that I, I we said to each other was, Everybody go, you know, we're going to record a new record and uh, go come back in about two months with your new songs. Uh, everybody said, well, see you then. We're all going to record our new songs, demo them, bring them together and see what what we got for the new, new record. Yeah. Now, what were those songs? I recorded and demoed Boys Are Gonna Rock. Um, Shoot You Full of Love, No Substitute, Animal, and Twisted. Those were the five songs that I wrote that I was going to bring back. Because in my mind, well, in my mind, I mean, they were demoed, and I said, oh, these are going to be, this is going to be one hell of a Kiss record. And I think they're going to love them, you know. So they asked me to come back. And I, I said, I, I, I will come back. I, I want to come back, but I, I've got to survive. I can't survive on this, you know? And I'm coming back with a great album. Can't we make this work? And unfortunately, the answer was no. So, uh, unless you sign the contract, then you can't come back. And I said, I, I, you know what? This is going to break my heart, and I can't come back. So then... About a month later, in May of 84, they sent me a letter saying, well, you're fired. So, I guess it was redundant because, you know, uh, whatever. But, because I already said I wasn't coming back if you can't make this work. And that's what happened. 
and it, it broke my heart. But I had, I had no money, no money, nothing. And to, to, to so the, 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 the fear of, I just came all the way, all this way, all this way, all this pain, all this, to struggle, all this for nothing, you know? To do what? To end this and go home again and say what? I've got demos, well, well, well now what? Now I've got demos, what the hell am I gonna do with these? So, I said, I'm gonna continue them because I know they're great. And now remember, these are just on a drum machine with, with the song laid out. I'm playing guitars, playing bass, had scratch vocals on them, and I'm thinking, I know these are great songs, the lyrics. I was I was really prolific, and I, I at that point, and I just all the lyrics were written really quickly, you know, because it was in me. So I went home, went back to California, and I kept asking, does anybody know a great singer, you know, that that would be great for this? No, no, you could try this guy, you could try this guy. After a while, I was just about to give up, and then somebody said, I know a singer that you can love. And his name was Robert Fleischman. And I said, really? So, I go over to Rob's house, and I, he plays me you know, some of his stuff, and, and I said, wow, this guy can sing, Chad. So I'm thinking, this would be great. This is just what I want for my record. Here. So I said, well, you wanna, you wanna you know, come down to the studio and sing? I got a bunch of songs, you wanna sing? Yeah, okay, great. So Rob came down to the studio and I pissed my pants. I said, oh, this is it, yeah, you know. So I said, I knew at that point that the magic, you know, I, I captured the magic. And it was like uh, my version of, you know, what Gene and Paul found with each other and Ace, what Jimmy Page found with Robert Plant, what John Lennon found with Paul McCartney, and I thought, this is my, this is my time, you know, to make that. So, we, I record, I finished the demos, and we finished um, Boys Are Gonna Rock, Shoot You Full of Love and No Substitute, and, um, found someone that said to me, who used to be a part of the KISS organization, uh, that ended up managing me for uh, a short time, said, I think Chrysalis Records is gonna love this. So, took it to Chrysalis Records, and I'm still in California, he's in New York, and I never forget that phone call, which was, Vinny, these people are going crazy. Can you hear it? So he puts the phone like this. Here, boys are gonna rock, blaring in, in the in the recordings in the Chrysalis's office, and so he says, "Hold on a second, uh, the head of Chrysalis wants to talk to you." And I'm thinking, "Shit, wow!" You know, but this is after a year of taking it to different record companies, and they're going, "I think you got something, Vinny. Keep working on it." <laughs> so Chrysalis set, signed it, and uh, I guess you guys know the rest. Where do you find that strength? Yeah. Is Rob still here? Rob am, I, am I talking too much? Are you, am I boring you? You sure? Because if I'm losing you, you got to tell me, shut up. You sure? Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, everybody. I'm just curious. You, so you, you, you're in you're the dream to be in Kiss. Then I'm sorry, you're what? It was your dream to be in Kiss. It was my dream to be in Kiss. It still is. <laughs> and then you're out of Do you Kiss. think that's a good idea? Yeah. yeah. Would, would you would you be uh, would you go to a Kiss show yeah. with Vinnie Vincent? Exactly, exactly. And creatures make up. <laughs>
Wait, I swear. Where do you find the strength? So you, you, you go from this band that you love to be in, you're out of the band. How do you find sort of that will and that strength to like, all of a sudden do your, new, your own thing? I've been dead many times. <laughs> More times than I want to I wanna ever, ever remember. Um, and just when it's over, I think, you know, goodbye everybody. And then it's like some, some huge hand just picks me up, just like a little packet of sugar and says, put you over here. And I go, okay, I'm not gonna argue with you. And I just, you know, God has always been in my life and uh, always since I was a little kid. And uh, so just when it was always over for me, whatever power, you know, that was uh, uh, saved me way too many times. That uh, it, it's a book that's coming, but times I don't want to remember, but that uh, that power was always there to save me. You're getting choked up. Is there a moment in particular, you, or two, you can think of that you want to share? That oh, man. yeah, there, there is. It's it's a real. <laughs> I don't know if I can go there, but if you want me to, I will. Yeah. I'll try to get through this. So uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, but. Uh, Leaving uh, when I left the band, uh, I just I felt you know just just ravaged. Came home, you know, went back to this uh, apartment we had in Hollywood. We had no furniture, we had no bed, we had a black and white TV with an antenna, you know, so. I remember one time the TV broke, so we had to go get it fixed. I took it down the Western Avenue to get a black and white TV fixed. <laughs> uh, so, uh, somebody said to me once, you know, you should take some of this, it'll make you feel really good, you know? And I said, oh, I don't do that stuff, you know? Come on, I know you're, I know you're hurting. So I had two babies. Uh, we had no money for food. I just came out of the band, you know, and I know there was, you know, two great records we left behind. I'm thinking, you know, what was all this for, you know? So eventually, I, I took somebody up on their offer, and. It lasted about two months, I remember, and it kept me it kept me in my mind from, you know, sinking so far down to saying, you know, where is there left to go, you know, after after all this. One day, um, I took too much of this stuff, and. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday. I was in the shower and I remember my body saying, you're going to die right now. And uh, I was probably a hair away from a heart attack. And I remember uh, I said to Anne Marie, I said, I'm going to die. And uh, she said, uh, what happened? And, and I, I said, this is what happened. And she says, you want me to call the paramedics? I said, no, no. So I said, all I want you to do is just sit with me by this window. And I remember it was like 2 in the afternoon. And it was really a serene, you know, it was a really quiet neighborhood. It was really serene. And uh, I was looking out the, out the window. And she said, I said, all I want you to do is tell me I'm going to live and everything's going to be all right. 
and she sat with me for 18 hours and she didn't go to sleep and she said you're gonna be all right everything's gonna be all right you're gonna live don't worry and all I remember is looking out this window and uh, we had a really pretty courtyard that was the one thing I do remember and uh, you know as I was a god kid all my life you know ever since I was a kid I mean I just it was natural for me you know and I, I grew up Roman Catholic I still am you know good or bad <laughs> but uh, you know I got attached to uh, to Jesus ever since I was a young kid so all I could remember saying was, please, Jesus, don't let me die. And I, I didn't stop saying it because I said, if I hold on to that, maybe I'll come through this. So I kept saying, Jesus, don't let me die. I've got two little children. I need to see them grow up. Sorry. If you wanted to hear it, I'm going to tell you. So... So I must have said this hundreds of times. I never stopped saying it for about two hours passed. And I, I said, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna live. And I was that close. And I remember I'm looking out this window and all of a sudden, if you believe me, that's okay. If you don't, that's okay. But all of a sudden I saw this, this, this figure right in front of me. This, this had to be about this big, and it was just this outline of, of a body, you know, and it was this, this blazing light, like I was looking into the sun, and I said to Emory, do you see that, and uh, she said, no, I said, look, look at this, and all I heard was the sound of an ocean wave, you know, like, shh. You know, just the sound of a wave, it was so quiet. And I'm looking at this thing, and, and, and it gave I, these, this, these words that said, not, not a voice, I didn't hear any talking, but this transference of everything is going to be all right. You're going to make it through this. And I made it through the night, and then within 45 seconds i don't think it was longer than that it just just disappeared and whatever it was it was one of those moments that you know i'm still here to talk to you about it so So we went on to brighter times and with the Vinyamins and Invasion. Well, from there it took, it took a long time to heal from that. Yeah. Uh, it took me about 10 years to actually, for my, my system, my body to actually heal from that. But for about a week, I could barely, barely walk. I didn't see a doctor because I, I, I made it through and I just said, this is good enough for me. Although I probably should have, but I didn't, and I, kept, I got stronger and stronger, and you know, eventually. But it took about 10 years to get through that. Wow. Um, and this was in June of 1984. God, I'll never forget. June 18th, 1984. I will never forget this for as long as I live. And um, then I, I said, Okay, now I, you know, what do I do now? And that—that's when I began these demos. Was June of '84, and they were ready about nine months later, and that's when it all started to come piece together. And then Chrysalis Records came, and so how these things happen to me, I don't know. I really don't know. They do. I, I've got the weirdest life of anybody I've ever known. Yeah. I, I, I have an assistant that I love with all my heart. She's been with me for so long, and she knows she knows the real stuff that happened. And 
she cares for me and she 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 loves me. She's always there. To, you know, just, uh, we always have this conversation. She says, "I've never known anybody that's got a life as strange as yours." But yeah, uh, I always wanted to be normal kid. You know, I was a normal kid. I figured I'd grow up to have a normal life like everybody, and it never turned out that way. <laughs> so. Can we get into a couple of, of, of things that I think a lot of fans want to know? For example, the 20 year lawsuit with Gene and Paul. 20 year lawsuit. Um, it could have all been avoided. There was no, it was senseless because it was, there were millions of dollars in warranties. And I tried for four fucking years. From 91 to 97 to say, can't we just work something out? You know? I mean, this wasn't something I wanted to do. This was like the last thing I wanted to do, you know? But it was right is right. And I'm willing to, you know, just, just show me some, you know, some humanity, you know, just a little, little compassion, you know? And maybe just just help me out, settle with me, you know, just something that to make to make all of this just have been worth it for me, you know. And uh, they said no, and they hurt me deeply, 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 fucking deeply. There was nowhere to go but to file this lawsuit. And it's all right, you know. It's it's just part of life, and there's nothing to feel bad for. You just. It's, it's it's part of my story, you know, and there's just nothing you can do about it. So, uh, it's all right. It's not, that's all right. You don't have to feel bad. <laughs> there's nothing to feel bad about, you know. I'm, I'm leaving you guys with a lot of music, and you know, who knows what's coming. That's the best part, right? The one thing that has saved me through 20 years, I'll tell you what, the, the, my friends that I love dearly crucified me. So I was crucified. I died and I was buried in, the, in that courthouse on Hill Street in Los Angeles by one judge that wanted to make sure he had a headstone that said, here lies Vinnie Vincent. Fuck you, Vinny. That's that was that was the what that lawsuit. You know that was the that was the, the the final ruling on my lawsuit. But I rose again, so I'm here. And the miracle that I survived that lawsuit was probably as miraculous as surviving what happened to me in 1984. And I just put it behind me. We eventually settled everything that we had be between us, all the problems, about seven years ago. But I was in hell for 20 years, and it was my hell, nobody knew it. And I saw, I saw the world going by, I saw what everybody was saying about me, I saw what everybody in the band was saying about me, and I said, what a shame, you know? What a shame, there was no reason for it. I mean, we could have had, in my opinion, such a fucking great band. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we still can. We still can because that magic never ends. When you, when you, I still love them. I mean, it's, it's never going to go away. So when you respect, and I do dearly respect Gene and Paul with all my heart, I love them, and I always will. They gave me this. With the good came the bad, but. Uh, the, the magic that we have together never dies because when I didn't see them from 84 to 91 91 was our first meeting again after Vinnie Vincent invasion and she said we're recording a new record I, I think I saw Gina in, in a recording studio and uh, give us a call let's work together I said ah, I'd love to love to see you and then revenge happened, and those songs, and it was, uh, I said, uh, this, this, is, this, this is the moment, you know, this is the band, this is it, you know, Unholy, 
uh, was Gene and I, just, that was our baby. Paul and I wrote two songs, and uh, we worked together for a year on that record. And um, it was, it was, it was, you know, another fun time. I mean, every time we worked together, it was just a joy. The magic, it's something that you can't, I can't put into words. Magic is not the right word for it because it's, it's, it's electric, you know, when you just, something that happens when you plug in something and, you, and, you know, there's electricity here, you know, it just works. So it turned out to be a great record and a lot of music that I'm proud of. So never say never, never say die. leading up to this the biggest thing that I heard from fans was they said we just want to know that Vinny's okay yeah. I'm okay now I wasn't okay for a long time you know I had a bad really bad marriage second marriage and can we talk about the I think and that's I think that was a big thing for a lot of fans is when they saw that fucking bug shot it, it was a fucking shot. It was horrible. It was like the worst thing. It was a day that, that was uh, surreal. You know, it was it, it, even to, even to this day, it was like that didn't really happen, did it? But it was so surreal, and it was the culmination of of 15, 17 years of two people that should not have been together, but. If I could, I think I could end it there, but I don't think it explains enough. It's not certainly not something that I would be happy with if I left you right now, not explaining and not telling you from my eyes, from my side of that story of what happened. I wouldn't be happy if I didn't let you hear it from me because you deserve to hear it. Um, I won't mention any names because I, I think it's not right, but the person I was married to began the marriage as a beautiful, really beautiful girl, really normal, you know, apple pie, you know, you know, type of, you know, beauty, you know, and, uh, but a really, really nice person and somebody I, I, I wanted in my life, you know, it's like, like you, marry somebody that is, you know, you hate, you marry somebody that you're attracted to. And uh, uh, she began to take uh, a medication and she took it too long and it began to transform. In my opinion, she began to transform. And then she began to drink and it was every day. And it was more and more and more and more and more. And we lived in this really secluded place. There was no money coming in. She worked. And this lawsuit was consuming me. And everything was just, you know, crumbling. It was just like watching the sinkhole just suck everything down. And she got more hateful, more violent, more drunk. And... I say this to you because I've never had a chance to defend myself and I watched everybody just just accuse me of the, the worst things I've ever I've ever been you know thought I could be accused of which were true everybody always says everybody who's accused says I'm innocent I didn't do it and it wasn't until something happened to me like this that I realized what that really means. So people can accuse you of something, and that didn't happen. But because the world is what it is, you're guilty. You've done this. And that's what I found myself in the middle of. So over the years, the situation got so violent that this person bought a gun. And the, with the drinking that was happening, the medication that was transforming 
this poor soul. I watched her, I tried so hard to help her, to take her out of this world, and she, I got her off the medication, but it was too late. And the, and the, the drinking just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and the violence got worse. Until, um, until it was January, January, February of 2011. And I had asked her to leave the house. We had two houses on this one big piece of land. And I said, you, you have to leave here or I'll leave something. But, you know, can't live under the same roof here because one day you're going to turn around and, and use your gun on me and kill me. So, um, you know, this is really personal, so I hope you appreciate how, you know, this is not something I would tell anybody, but I'm telling you, it's going on the internet, but I think I'm doing it for the reason that I have to. If I don't tell you now, then this is always going to live back there, and it's never going to be cleansed. And I said to myself, I want to do this, so this is cleansed, and it's, it's, you know, finally put to rest, and it's finally explained, without you people saying, I wonder if you really did that, you know, and I said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you leave, I, I'm not going to even show up if I'm not able to tell you what really happened, because if I don't tell you, you're still going to think that, you know, you're still going to question it. Did you do it or did you not or whatever? Whatever it was I was accused of doing, you know? So, the dogs. This is part of what leads to that day of that mugshot. Now the dogs, these are my babies, okay? I, I was a kid that wanted dogs and cats and all animals. My, my mom, my dad loved animals, you know, but we lived in an apartment. You know, we lived on uh, Archie Bunker Street, you know, three family house, couldn't have a cat. Don't feed the cats, you know, because, you know, they'll keep coming, you know. Don't feed the dog, they'll keep coming. Well, why not, you know? But it was my, uh, it was the landlord. I can't do it, so okay. Anyway, so, during the 90s, I'm sorry, during, yeah, during the 90s. Um, we began to rescue and adopt all these, these abused animals. And if anybody, if any dog, you know, was having a bad day, come on, you know, come on home. So we had as many as we could take and uh, we rescued everything we could rescue until the drinking got real bad. And then once the drinking got bad, everything else got bad, real bad. So when the violence was at its peak, I said, you need to, you need to move out for, until you can either stop this or pull yourself together or this relationship completely ends, but you cannot live here or I will not live here, but you're not capable of taking care of these animals. So I am caring for everybody, and that's fine. So she had picked another place to live, <clears throat> and now we we had <clears throat> three or four dogs that were, you know, big dogs. They were just, you know, Dobermans, those kind of dogs, and. They could not be out at the same time. The little ones were out. And you had to really be conscious of, of this. Otherwise, the, you know, what eventually happened would have happened. So um, she came, I remember, I remember this. My God, it was horrible. On a Saturday, I think it was in February, she came back three Saturdays in a row, from middle of February to the first of March. Three Saturdays in a row. So every seven days during three weeks, three weeks in a row, she 
We come back on a Saturday, drunk, violent, and angry, and ready to make hell on earth, you know, come to life. And she break, you know, just just force her way into the house. Got into the house, and uh, literal literal hell would just break completely unearth itself. And I mean, I was just left dazed, just dazed of, you know, how the fucking hell can I survive this any longer? So I'd be upstairs, and she'd leave downstairs, through the downstairs door. And being completely shit-faced, intoxicated, whatever you want to call it, walks out the door, gets into her car, unaware, unaware that one of the little dogs follows her out while the big dogs are out. And she pulls the car out of the, of the, of the driveway and about 10 minutes later I hear the screaming, the screaming of one of my dogs. And then I, you know, when you got big dogs trying to kill a smaller dog, you got sound that you just don't want to hear. You know, it's it's impossible to live with. I run out there and I find one of my dogs ripped to shreds in pieces. And it happened because of a very drunk, angry person. So I reach her on her cell phone. I said, you left this door open and caused the death of this little soul. She kept on her way. I had to take this poor dog and put it, wrap it in towels and uh, just bring it in. And it, it was just, you know, the horror of it was just too, too impossible to explain in words. So the relationship was getting worse and worse, it was like now on, on, on maximum overload. So I said, don't ever come back here again. Seven days later, she comes back again. Now, we're still going through this, this horribleness on a daily basis, but seven, seven days later, she comes back again. The same thing happens. The same identical thing happens. Same identical thing happens, only it's a different dog. And the same identical uh, set of circumstances comes, comes into the house, violent beyond words, ready to kill me, picks whatever argument there was to pick, buries me into, you know, into oblivion, walks out of the house, gets in her car, pulls out, leaves the door open, not aware that another dog had gotten out, with the same big dogs that were out, because it's a routine. It's, you know, a certain amount of dogs go out this day, you know, I'll get them in. Another dog gets murdered. But dogs are dogs, that's what they do. You know, the big ones are big, the little ones are little, and when they see little dogs that's not supposed to be there, they're gonna make sure that, that you know, they tear her to pieces, and I'm saying, Jesus Christ, not again. This is not possible. This is just not fucking possible. And here I am, got another dog with her ear was on the ground. I had to take her ear with me and bring her inside. And I said, do you realize what you just did? And, you know, and we, the same scenario. Week number three. The same identical thing happened again. Dog number three. These were my babies. These were my, my, my children. I love them. They were everything to me. One dog, her name was Christmas, because I got her on Christmas Eve. I, I rescued her from a, basically from an incinerator for dogs. And Tennessee was, you know, it's a bad state for, you know, for animal abuse, and 
she was a, um, a collie, Shetland collie. And then there was a Chihuahua mix, and the other one was a Lab. So I lost three beautiful dogs that I rescued because of someone's intoxication. So how did that end up with the mugshot? How did you end up being arrested? You have to, the list is what will follow. So it was the winter time. She didn't want to be bothered with them. And they were dead because of her. She took full responsibility, oddly enough, in front of my attorney uh, at a later period of time. And also in an email, she took full responsibility to me. About three weeks later, in her moment of remorse. So it was too late, you know, three beautiful dogs were dead, little souls I loved were dead. And I had, it was winter, the ground was hard, and I, she didn't want to be bothered with burying them or doing anything, so I wrapped them in blankets and I had to put them in some kind of a, you know, place where I could put them in a storage tub to rest them, you know. And uh, I had the three of them in their own little little coffins, and I couldn't bury them until the ground was thawed, and I could get a, an excavator. I had to get an actual steam shovel to come and, and dig up the ground to get them buried. So in the meantime, here they are, you know, in the garage, because that was the only place I can keep them, and it was May, May 21st, the day my world changed forever. Um, she came back and it was violence on times a thousand and the day began with violence drinking 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 and uh, accusing me of things that I didn't do and drinking more and saying I'm, I have a gun and I'm gonna kill you and she was attacking me a lot with her fists and I remember having to hold her by the hair to, to stop her from, from, you know, you know, people have force when they're gonna, you know, do whatever they wanna do. Whatever happened, I went upstairs and to get away from her, she followed me upstairs and I used to film her all the time on my camera because I said, you know, if I die, she shoots me. Nobody's gonna know what this life inside this prison was like. So, I filmed her all the time. And she was very happy to perform for this camera. So I've got, I've got nothing but video of, of this insanity that was taking place in this house. And so I knew that day that this is the daytime. I said something, my life is about to change today and I don't know how the fuck it's gonna happen. But today's the day. And um, she was talking into the camera and said, uh, you pulled my hair and, and like, dragged me and, but never mentioned anything. There was no blood on her, no nothing. There was just like looking at everybody here. As clean as we all are here with no blood on us, that's what the camera showed. And was that? So the camera showed nothing. And I had to film this because I needed some documentation. So this is about Two, three, two, three in the afternoon, and she says, I'm leaving. So I'm filming her walking down the stairs, out the door. She never came back. So it was like looking at anybody else here, you know, looking at you. See you later. I'm out of here, you know. Of course, it wasn't like that, but it was violent, you know. And she walked out the door, and about midnight, she never came back. It's about midnight. 
And I remember trying to sleep. It was really a horrible day. And all of a sudden I hear something outside the window and there was like a flashlight and there was somebody saying, you know, you need to come out of your house. You know, I'm saying, what the fuck? You know, you need to come out of your house. You know, Mr. Cassandra, you need to come out of your house. Something like that. And I'm, what? You know, what? And I could not believe what was happening. And I looked out the window and I see like, I don't know, it could have been five or six cop cars out there. There had to be at least 14, 15 police officers there with rifles and, and, and guns drawn. I'm saying, what in God's name, what happened? What's going on? You know, so I walked downstairs and they frisked me and I remember telling, telling, asking one of the cops, I said, are you gonna kill me? I was really serious. They said, shut up, no talking. And just get in the car, they handcuffed me, frisked me, and I said, what did I do? Shut up, no talking. So I'm sitting in the back of the car and I'm handcuffed and I had no idea why. So got to the police station and of course they processed me. It was like three in the morning and I'm going, like, what am I doing here? And they told me. So they pulled me in a room. You know, you're accused of this and that and domestic abuse and blood all over this person. And, and I'm going, I said, whoa, this is really weird. I said, so do you want to make a statement? I said, no way. I said, if you don't mind, I will not say anything until I talk to my lawyer. So... That's, they said, that's fine. So I called my assistant and I said, can you believe this? So I'm now in a, in a, in a jail cell for something that, that I, I have proof that never happened, video proof that never happened. And they said, uh, there's all this blood. I said, blood from what? Well, from this and that. I said, well, that, I said, really? I said, okay. And I didn't want to say anything. I just said, I'm not going to tell you anything because when you say I didn't do it, you did it. That's it, you know. So no matter what you say, you did it. So I said, this is, you know, and I watch enough Perry Mason to know that innocent people get accused of crimes that they didn't do. You know, thank God there was a Perry Mason, you know, because all these people that get, you know, convicted, you know, accused of murder, and they're in jail for something that, that you know the cop knows he did. She did, you know, this proof that somebody didn't do it. So I'm in this jail cell and I'm thinking, oh my God, this, I knew my day was going to change forever today. I knew it. And I'm sitting in this jail and I'm thinking, you know, it's just so surreal. And I'm laying in this, you know, really cold, you know, piece of metal and I'm laying there and I can't believe this is happening to me. And so they, you know, processed me, and I'm thinking, you know, this is really, this is so terrible, it's hard to believe. So, it's about three in the morning, they take this mugshot, I go back to this, okay, go back to this, but there was these really, something really interesting happened. I'm trying to sleep, you know, I called my assistant, and I said, you know, this is what happened, she says, don't worry, this will all we'd be okay. So... Uh, it's about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and I, there's this music blaring all of a sudden out of nowhere. And I, I'm, I says, God, I, I know that song, you know. And I'm, I'm like trying to sleep, and I had a monster, monster, monster migraine headache. And there, there was nobody helping me. And I said, geez, I hope, I, I don't know what the hell's going to happen here. And I just hear this music blaring, and it was that time of year. And I said, what the fuck? I said, am I hearing something? And, and I remember saying, hearing. We love you, Vinny, don't worry. <laughs> it was like some of the younger cops. And I said, We're, you know, and I, I heard somebody yell that. And I said, wow. Nobody would believe this because I don't. So that was my night of something that was so horrible. I got bailed out the next day about noon. 
And that was the beginning of the end. But in, in what happened during the, that last day was when the police came, so did the, the animal uh, abuse, ASPA, ASPCA or whatever came, and found these dogs. And they uh, jumped to the immediate immediate conclusion, you know, immediate accusation. These are, are these abuse? Are these animals abuse? Which is something I would jump to, you know? This is something that I would say. You got dogs out here in containers, you know? Who killed them? So she said, our bigger dogs killed them. So the authorities took the dogs out and, best, you know, they investigated it, rightly so, and they found out that it was true that you know, they were killed by other dogs. But yet, because I was Vinnie Vincent, because I was a rock star in a, in a town that hated KISS, they looked at KISS as, we don't want you kind here, you know? And that's the way it is and was. So I was already accused of killing these dogs in the media when fact it was anything but that so I was in a bad bad situation because now I'm accused of domestic abuse which I didn't do then I'm abused of killing dogs which I didn't do so the way it ended was the videos played the card that said you didn't do this Vinny and everything ended and I won't go any farther than that, but that's, that was it, so. Um, I think now you know, and that's exactly the way it happened. So. I believe you. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, thank you for saying that, but even respectfully, respectfully saying this to anyone. If you didn't believe it, that's okay. But I know that's what happened. And we're in a world now where you believe somebody or you don't. And it's up to your choice to do or say whatever you believe. But I had to tell you this, and that's, that's all I could do. Another story I think fans always wonder, if you just to cover it briefly, is the infamous box set. Infamous Wait, box set. It? Okay, I know, I know the story. Vinny ripped us off, intentionally took our money. I know it all. I know it. Um, I, I had some box boxes that I was going to bring, but in all the craziness, the posters are here but I didn't bring, I, I forgot to bring the boxes. Um, I spent, this happened in 95, I remember. The internet had just uh, got started, and uh, I wanted to, you know, I've got all this music, and it was gonna start as some cassettes. And I remember spending about $30,000 of money that, I mean, that was all I had. And I spent it all putting this together because I really wanted, I wanted the fans to have this, you know? There was so much stuff I had recorded, and I went through all of this. I, I went through the artwork, I went through the box pressing, I went through everything. And I had all the music compiled, and it got 75% finished, and I made the biggest, another one of my famous mistakes. I figured, well, this is going to be finished. I know everybody, you know, I, I put the idea out there and everybody said, well, we want to buy it now. I said, okay, we'll take pre-orders. One of my famous mistakes, I took pre-orders, which I shouldn't have done. I should have, should have waited for it to be completely finished. So I, I figured a price that I could charge everybody was 120 bucks. I didn't take many orders, thank God. But the people whose, whose money who paid for it uh, all of a sudden there was a cross, life crossed itself again on me. 
So instead of finishing it and giving everybody the box set, the lawsuit sucked me into a jet engine and never to be heard from again. So here I am with everybody, you know, it, was, it didn't happen until about a few years later, and I, I saw it on the internet, Vinny's ripping people off, and I was like, oh shit, you know, here we go again. So I'm now into this horrible lawsuit, and with somebody who wanted to make sure that I never lived to tell. And I figured, you know, it's all just crumbling, and it's getting worse. Hopefully there'll be a good end to the story, I don't know where, but... What happened was, uh, one of my lawyers at the time said, oh, I'll pay for it, don't worry, I'll put up the money, we'll finish your box, you can give every, all the fans the, the, you know, the product. She disappeared on me and said, I can't do this now, so we can't finish your box set. And I was, then I was mess, left with a real mess. So. I was hoping that one day I could finish it and talk to you all and said, please forgive me, I'm so sorry. It's not what I wanted to happen, uh, but I'm really sorry for everybody who thought that this is what I was doing, but it wasn't. Uh, I wanted you to have the music, I, wanted you, I still want you to, to have it. And when Derek called me and said, let's do this, I started working on it again and Hopefully, I'm going to work my tail off to make sure I get this box finished this year and everybody will have what they paid for and with a few thank you gifts from me to say I'm really sorry it took so long, but better late than never. So, that's it. Am I talking too much for you? No! You sure? No! Uh, am I boring anybody? No! no? Thank you guys back there. You know, I love you. I never did this before. I never got this personal. But I needed this. You know, I needed it for me. So. Are you going to do some new music from you this in the coming year, coming two years? You bet, you bet, you bet. I've got, I've got so, so many songs, you know. And I actually was recording uh, into the late 90s, so I've got a lot of stuff still. Hey, is there, who's the guitar here? Do this or do that, and if you don't do this, terrible things are going to happen. So 
So, Bill was my uh, guitar tech during the video game cinemation. And we're playing Worcester Central. I don't know if you know that show it was with uh, Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper. It was 1986. It was Worcester Central. It's a sold out show. And some asshole uh, decided to sue me because of some kind of you know, the jilted lover complex he had, you know, of, of you know, uh, I won't go into it because it's not worth it. So he has a, a friend that, that was an, a lawyer and they figured they lived somewhere in that area and they were going to sue the big rock star that fucked over the little guy, you know. So they send in a, they get a, pull some legal strings and got the, uh, a judgment, and without me not uh, un completely unaware that anything was happening, so they got the marshal to come into the centrum, Worcester Centrum, to confiscate all of my equipment. And this happened like 30 minutes before the show was about to start. And so all I'm backstage, you know, I'm playing, I'm playing, and and all of a sudden. Pandemonium breaks out. Vinny, there's Marshall here, the law here, the police here. They're, they're taking all your equipment. I said, what for? You know, what are you talking about? Some, something about a judgment. I don't know. Well, what about somebody that's got, you know. I was like, what are you, the hell are you talking about? You know, and I got this album that looks like this is going to be a hit album. And so all of a sudden, I watched them. Load my, because it was like, like a court order. They took everything, all the amps, all the drums, everything that was there that had Vinnie Vincent Invasion on it. And this incredible person, Bill Temple, I, all, I, all I knew was, oh, fuck, you know, I only got two of my flying V, two of my Vinnie Vincent double Vs. You know, these are the two prototypes. I mean, this, this was like, I only have two of these, and... I said, they fucking took my guitars, too. So Bill said, he, he remember he was shaking his head. He said, Don't. So he said, just, just, I'll tell you tomorrow. They're driving the equipment off in some big, huge truck, and, you know, this asshole and his buddy thinking, ah, we fucked over Vinny, you know? I'm thinking, Jesus, this is like, this is ridiculous. This is horrible. So, uh, my biggest worry was the guitars, you know? These were my babies, you know? This is, this is, you know, this is my, my double V, you know? And I'm, I was like the pink one, you know? And so, Bill, I said, so they got everything. He says, mm-mm. I said, what do you mean? I said, did they get the guitars? He says, mm-mm. I said, what do you mean? He says, I put it in the bathroom stall. You know, I'm unrehearsed here, so, but I figured, you know, enough with the words, maybe some chords, huh? Is that all right? You left me here alone I guess I'll never see the light You turned another stone She makes all your wrongs alright Another wavelength theme Somehow it brings you more But tonight for sure I'll see those tears And the damage they do You're breaking my heart with those tears And I cry 
Can we make a new start of all the girls I've had at my knees? You're the only one who could bring me to those tears. Maybe just one, one person. This is 
I still love you. Killers! Has taken your love. It's true, isn't it? It's not just talk that I hear. And when I see him build his wall around you, I know the end is near. You tell me. It's wrong, and it's all in my mind. You know, all along, and it just makes my Thank you. Thank you for coming. I love you. I 
love you so much. Thank you so much for this. Thank you guys. I hope you had a great time.